Hi friends at Citrus Grove, Phil Hunter here. I'm glad to gather with you in this way. Uh, it probably means that you're out of town or you're not feeling well or you're uncomfortable being in the inside of our cafeteria while this wave passes. Uh, understandable, I, got, uh, I get it. That's why this video is here for you. And I'm glad that you're taking the time to listen to it. Let me uh, begin with uh, the words that were spoken at our baptism, more than just words and more than just water. Uh, a welcoming into God's family and washing away of your sins. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. In his name, let's hear some passages from the Bible. I'm going to read you two today. Uh, one from the, uh, a little letter in the, the New Testament of the Bible toward the end. It's the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4. It'll talk about what Jesus did and went through for you. And then we're going to go into Luke, like we, like we always have been doing here in this series. We're in chapter 4, and we're going to see exactly the, the, the account, the historical account of what Jesus did uh, in a certain stretch of days long ago. And um, I think by linking these two passages together, we're going to pick up on, on some things that I'll talk about in, in the sermon in a minute. So here first is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and following. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We're going to turn in a second to uh, Luke 4, but uh, I, I, I just love those, those words. I, I want them to ring in your ears this week. Um, they really talk about uh, uh, Jesus' goals, what he was here to accomplish, how much he went through and endured, and uh, reminds you of that, and, and then how much he, he cares for you, that he was willing to do that. Think about it this way. A person, you for example, can be a big dreamer. But that doesn't necessarily mean you get a lot done. It just means you have big goals. Or it's possible for someone to be a really hard worker and not be a very nice person. It just means that they put in a lot of hours doesn't mean that they're very friendly. A huge part of the beauty and the majesty of Jesus was that he perfectly combined three characteristics, personality traits, that even the best among us can't even do one of very consistently. They are mission, action, and compassion. Mission, action, compassion. We'll talk about all three of them. But uh, they work together. They uh, are, form kind of a chain of, uh, of hard work and of goals and of care for you. Think about it this way. With no sense of your big picture, your mission, all the actions that you might do, they're pointless. Literally. You don't know why you're doing them. What are you trying to accomplish by working so hard? And it's also true that actions without love, even a lot of actions without love, they're just worthless. 1 Corinthians 13, the great love chapter of the Bible, calls it like an obnoxious noise. So what if you worked super hard, you put in so many hours, if you're a jerk? If there's no compassion in your heart, uh, no one will want to be like you or be with you, do anything with you. Finally, the, the actions that we resolve to do, they're tough enough by themselves without 
also needing to know the mission, without also needing to be done with compassion. The actions themselves are, are just too tough for us sometimes to keep doing. We just can't, or we won't, or we don't do what we set out and resolve to do. Maybe we're distracted or lazy or we get some better offer out there. We, you, I, rarely combine mission plus action plus compassion. So today, uh, we gather as a, as a church and together this way, not just to buck each other up, and I'm not here to, to tell you to try harder this week, but to admire Jesus. Just like every time when we gather, Jesus is the hero, he's the solution, the fix. Not only was he the, the hardest working person to have ever walked this earth, the most beleaguered and embattled and tested and tried soul, but he did all of that with a very sharp sense of his purpose, why he was working so hard. And he did it all with a heart full of love for you. And what good his hard work will do for you. So there's our simple outline today. Between Hebrews 4 and Luke 4, you have all you need to know about Jesus' mission, action, and compassion. So you heard Hebrews 4, now listen to Jesus at work in Luke 4, the first 11 verses. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the, of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Let's talk first about Jesus' mission, for which the Holy Spirit led him out into that wilderness. Without knowing his mission, remember, Jesus' actions don't matter. You wouldn't care about them. You need to know what mission he's on. In that earlier reading from Hebrews, you heard, Jesus was called a specific title, our great high priest. You know that you have a high priest? Yeah, we do. Right now, you have a high priest. It's not me. If you're a sinner, you really do want to have a high priest on your side. Why? Well, what does a high priest do? In the Old Testament, you might see the high priest uh, praying on behalf of the people, leading them in song, teaching them, counseling individuals. But a lot of people who weren't the high priest also did those things. The big thing that set the high priest apart, he offered sacrifices. The big sacrifices. The ones that took away sin. Now, think about this. Would a great high priest ever grab one of the sick animals to offer on the altar? Or the grain that was starting to mold and smell funny? No, he, he took his job seriously as high priest. It had to be a perfect sacrifice. The best they had, according to God's law, it had to meet exactly what God said he should offer. And particularly, once a year, he'd take the best there was into God's presence in the most holy place and then come back out and let the people know it's done I've made the sacrifice to the Lord and your sins are atoned for. You're at peace with God. Go home at peace. The high priest did that. And Jesus is your high priest. So here's his mission. To sacrifice so that you would be forgiven. He would, of course, also lead and teach and pray and heal. But those are secondary. His mission was sacrifice a perfect lamb and take away your sins. He needed to make it to the altar of the cross, to lay down his own life. And he had to stay perfectly pure until he did that. 
So he needs this laser focus on, on what he's doing, why he's doing it, his mission here. And anything that attempted to distract him or discourage him or put a mark or an injury on him, on this perfect lamb, needs to be recognized as a trap and stopped or avoided or fought against. So what's the mission of your life? What started at your baptism drives you now and you pray will continue into eternity? You've got to figure that out. You've got to draw it from the Bible and get used to phrasing it in a way that you'll remember and it flies off your lips whenever you get a chance to answer the big question, what's the meaning of life? Your answer is your mission. Uh, you Christians have some good freedom in being able to phrase it in ways that are drawn from the Bible. Uh, you could say, my mission is to glorify God with the time and talents he's given me. Or you could say, it's to get to heaven and take as many people with me as I can. You could say to love Jesus and love my neighbor. You could say to stand firm on the word of God. That's great. Know your mission because that's what drives your actions. Mission drives your actions. That's why you can persevere when life gets tough. If you know your mission, you know why you're here and what you're going through for a reason. And, and that's how you can also recognize a trap when you see one. Because it's whatever interferes with the mission God has put before you. That's a trap. In the movie Taken, Liam Neeson has to get his daughter back. And I, that's about as much as I remember. I know he has some particular skills he used to get his daughter back. If I recall, he, he drove fast and he punched and kicked and whatever. But I, I, I know that at the end, he gets his daughter back. In that case, his mission and his dedication stick with you, even if the, the details of how he did it, his actions, were forgettable. His mission was get his daughter back. He did it. So forgive the comparison here, but Jesus was totally dedicated to his mission, to rescue his children. His actions, though, are, are memorable. <laughs> they're not forgettable like some movie. They're, they're memorable things that Jesus did. I mean, it's helpful because we, we review them whenever we gather and we summarize them in our creeds. We read them to our kids and the, maybe the images of the things that Jesus did while he walked around here on earth are etched into your mind from Sunday school or from Bible studies. That's awesome. Jesus deserves to be remembered for his actions. For example, what we heard today out in the wilderness where he's resisting every temptation, that's memorable. Even some of the details from hearing that, whether this was the first time you've heard that account or, or the hundredth time, I bet you could pass a quiz. If I gave you a quiz on, on what happened uh, out there in the desert, you know, the details like the 40 days, like how he was hungry, or even the, the specific sins that Satan was trying to get him to jump into, and then the memorized Bible passages that Jesus used to respond to each one. You could probably summarize the details and, and pass a quiz on it. But take a closer look at each of those three temptations, the traps, and ask yourself, would I have fallen for this one? If I were really desperately hungry, would I sin to get food and survive? Do I crave comfort so much that if someone could guarantee me an easy life, sure, I'll do whatever you want. Or could I be misled by someone misquoting scripture at my front door? So misled that I, I, I throw myself off a cliff, throw away everything I, I know that is true, and I, and I just listen to this one person and just jump. Now, before you say, well, that's crazy. I would never do that. Well, know that Jesus really was tempted by these traps. You don't have to uh, impress him by saying, no, I don't get tempted by those things. He's been there. He knows it. Know that Jesus really was tempted. He, the pull that he experienced to give in and sin that passed through his mind of what happens if I do this. The pull was strong as it is for anyone, as any pull you've experienced. But keep in mind, these are just three occasions, three actions where Jesus said no. Three quick snapshots on one day or a few days of his 40th, uh, 30th year of life. And Jesus looks good in all three of them. They're recorded here. And, and we go, wow, he did it. Three, three for three. 
it's not quite as impressive as realizing this is just one day. What about every day? He never had a bad day in his 33 years of life. Not one. Any given moment you picked out, if you could scroll through his whole life story and follow him with a camera, never once would you find one frame where he wasn't on the ball, resisting, saying no, staying strong. Impossible for us to fathom. Just, just try to count how often you are tempted in any way. Maybe a dozen times a day, maybe a hundred times a day. Even if you only gave in to a few of those over the course of a lifetime, well, that, it's a mountain. And the rest of us are, are no more perfect than you. I'm not just picking on you. It's all of us. Jesus faced the same number of traps that you have. He just never gave in. He saw them, and when he saw them, he didn't jump into them. He went around them or ran away from them or, or fought them. Whew. When are you most likely to fall into one of those traps? Is it when you're angry, tired, hungry, when you're frustrated? Jesus was all those things at different times, but never in his weakness disobeyed God. He can honestly say he gets it. He's been there. He knows how powerful your demons are. But he can also say he beat them one by one. Jesus' mission to offer a perfect sacrifice kept driving all of those actions. Every day he needed to be spot on. He had to perform flawlessly. Here, his perfect answers, coupled with his perfect actions, sent the devil packing. But the next day, start it all over again. That's how it goes, day after day. Glory be to Jesus for, for spotting the traps that we would have fallen into and for doing what we could never have done on our own. Our great high priest got the work done. Friends, Jesus is great, and he's awesome, and he deserves praise from everyone with a heartbeat and breath in our lungs. But we just have this, this thing where uh, someone being great and awesome at what they do isn't enough for, to make us like them. Our praise just doesn't flow unless we know what that great person has done for me. I know it sounds selfish, but it's just the way it is. Uh, everyone puts Jesus through the same test. Okay, so he was, and Jesus had this big dream, this great mission. Good for him. And Jesus' actions were great. They were perfect, much better than I could ever do. Okay, good for him. What about me? <laughs> but get this, Jesus took on his mission and he did those actions because he loves you. He did them to benefit you. You benefit from Jesus. And if it's selfish to say that, fine. It's the truth. You can admit it. Jesus clearly has great compassion for you and for me. Right at the end of that Hebrew passage, you heard that your high priest, he avoided every trap and he offered his perfect sacrifice and he sat down in heaven so that you and I may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And there it is, his compassion still at work, helping you in your time of need. When you're tempted, he helps you spot the trap and avoid it or say no to it, resist it. You're not all on your own. He has grace that helps you. He still loves you. Post-sacrifice, your priest is still working for you. He still has compassion on you today and all this week. In the end, though, the best compassion that Jesus shows us is not help. Help is great in the moment, but what if you've already fallen into a trap? What if you keep thinking about the traps that you fell into in the past, you slipped into them, and help can't undo those? What you need for those is, is grace. Undeserved love that washes away sins and, and, and somehow clears up your record. Well, that's exactly what Jesus promises you and gives you. You receive mercy and grace from your great high priest. In fact, his grace that washes you clean also helps you avoid jumping in the mud the next time. Lastly, just remember Jesus' mission, to be your great high priest. The high priest's job was not to help you. 
he sacrifices and he forgives you. The high priest uh, uh, is, is not given the job of, uh, of helping you. If you need help, you get a coach, you get a teacher, you get a mentor. And actually, those are all ways that the Bible describes a different person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit. He uses the Bible's message to build your faith and train you and make you stronger, more fruitful and productive uh, for a life of following Jesus and avoiding the devil's traps. If you want to be cleansed of filth after falling into one of those traps, if you want to be sure that you're on God's good side, if you want to praise a truly compassionate Savior, you need more than a coach's help. You need a great high priest who does a perfect sacrifice and declares you holy. Jesus, friends, is your great high priest. And he has done exactly that. Glory be to Jesus for his mission, for his, his actions, and for his compassion on me and on you. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, your Savior. Let's pray. Almighty Savior, thank you for that mission you went on, for keeping it in front of your eyes the entire time you walked this earth and didn't let anything get in your way. Forgive us for uh, not understanding why you put us here. Help us to see our mission clearly. Thank you for your actions, flawless and perfect. Forgive us for our sins and the actions we didn't do out of, out of fear or neglect or selfishness or confusion. Uh, give us the right words to say and the right things to do so that we benefit the people around us. Thank you for your compassion. That's what uh, got you out of bed every day and kept you holy on your walk. That's what led you to the cross. We praise you for your compassion. Give us hearts like yours. Allow us to, to copy what you did. When we see someone who's, who's undeserving of love, help us love them. We pray today for, for those who are ill and recovering, those who are traveling on our, our roads. Keep people safe, Lord. Protect bodies, protect souls. Uh, we prayed last week for Bob and Sue Ball, relatives of Donna Johnson, uh, and you called Bob to your side in heaven. We praise you for the victory you gave him. You've left Sue recovering in the hospital. We ask to re restore her health and uh, comfort her as she and the rest of her family mourns. Be with everyone who has a, has a prayer. We trust that you hear those prayers of your children and call to you in Jesus' name. And we know that you'll answer them in the best possible way. So we pray the way that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. If you'd like to give an offering to support the work of our church, Citrus Grove Lutheran Church here in Wesley Chapel, you can do that online. That's probably the easiest and best way. You use the link that's in the description below this video. That's also where you can find uh, uh, all sorts of resources, including hymns that you can click and sing along with, um, things that you can download, resources from this service. Uh, you can uh, contact and get in, in, onto our email sign-up list, or our email list that goes out each each week, once a week, you get uh, an email packed full of links and, and good information and uh, news about ministries going on here and links to an online Bible study we do on Wednesdays that digs a little farther into each of these Bible passages. Uh, so look for that to, to go out each, each week as well. Um, also, I wanted to let you know about next week coming up, we'll uh, go out to a park in the area and hike around. Sometimes it's nice to uh, enjoy people's company outside of the, the four walls of Pinecrest. So we're going to go down to uh, Trout Creek Park. Uh, it's on Morris Bridge, all, almost all the way down to, down to Tampa. Um, the uh, best way to get there after, after worship next week is just after worship ends. Uh, bring, your, bring your lunch, pack a lunch, uh, bring your hiking shoes along, 
and we'll just head down uh, from Pinecrest, just plunk, plunk in the address, we'll have that there for you, and you can go down and hike around for as long or as short as you'd like. Uh, just a, a fun little thing we've got coming up. Uh, wonderful to spend this time worshiping with you. Uh, God bless you and yours, and, and take care. Look forward to gathering with you next time.